Well, good afternoon. My name is Gary Connor, and uh, this is our third webinar. And it's exciting to have the chance to have you join us again. And we're going to be talking about setup reduction, which is uh, one of my favorite topics uh, because I was an operator, uh, press brake operator, and laser operator, and uh, turret punch operator in a precision sheet metal shop for a number of years. And so I think setup was probably the best part of my day because it was a chance to get away from the machine and uh, go find some blueprints and material and pallets and everything it took to get the job done. And, and it was a chance to have a little variety in my life. And so I looked at setup as, as a good thing. And once we started examining the Toyota production system, we realized that setup is not a good thing. It's, it's our enemy. And so just like a, an Indy car pit stop, uh, we needed to figure out a way to get in and out of the pits quickly. And so we started adopting the single minute exchange of dye approach that uh, is used by many of the Japanese firms and by Toyota in particular. So what we're going to do is go over a couple of uh, the techniques and show you a couple of case studies. And if you want a copy of uh, the spreadsheet that I use throughout this presentation, uh, I use a setup production spreadsheet that makes it easy for teams to be able to do their own setup production project and, and play I call it playing what if, what if we did this or what if we did that, what effect would that have on setup? So if you want to copy that at the end of the uh, presentation, we'll give you a, an email address where you can uh, contact us and get a copy. So let's get to work. Again, setup reduction has historically and at least uh, been a really positive thing for sports teams, but at work teams, uh, we tend to resist it. We don't think about the machine that we're running or the process that we're running uh, like a, an IndyCar or a NASCAR uh, race car team does where that is the process that's making the money, and we are just uh, more or less a vehicle to get that process back out on the track as fast as we possibly can. So we need to change our mindset a little bit about that and think about what we do in terms of how we approach a setup in a machine that's in a, in a setup mode and look at it as a pit stop and a pit crew approach to get those things up and running because that's really the money maker in most manufacturing environments. So that's the approach we're going to take uh, throughout this presentation today. And that really is a, a mindset shift. Uh, you might call it an epiphany or a light bulb moment. If you look up the, the definition for the word epiphany, it's a it's an intuitive perception of something that five minutes ago seemed totally foreign to you, and now it makes perfect sense. And until you've seen uh, a race and, and the pit crew working to get that car in and out in 12 seconds, uh, and, and then you watch somebody spend two or three minutes in the pits, you realize there's no way they cannot go fast enough to ever catch them. So uh, when we look at that in, a, in our working environment, it makes perfect sense as well. If our competition in our sheet metal shop, for example, was averaging 36 minute setups on their press breaks, which is kind of the heart and uh, soul of a, of a sheet metal uh, environment, and we could do our setups in six minutes, there was absolutely no way they could catch us. And so when you're making sheet metal components that go like into a, a computer that has 80, uh, 80 components into it, and you're doing 36 minute setups on each of those 80 components, uh, it adds up over the course of a week and a month and a year to thousands and thousands of hours of machine downtime. And so the new capacity that you gain uh, by doing setup reduction uh, can make the difference between profit or loss. Uh, so we use a, a, a Kaizen approach, which is the Japanese word uh, or term for continuous improvement. And so changing things for the better, and we know that change is tough on people, but uh, it's, it's the only way that we're going to make significant changes in our process that, that keep us competitive and keep us thriving, especially in the economic environment we find ourselves today. So uh, if, you, if I use that word Kaizen today, that's what it means, continuous improvement. And Kaizen is really just that. It's, it's incrementally better every day, and that's everybody's job. Uh, sometimes we do another kind of uh, transformation, which is another Japanese word called uh, kaikaku, which means radical change. And, and we do a little of both of those in our projects. So uh, it's everybody's job to do Kaizen every day, but sometimes uh, having a team approach to go in and actually uh, change things radically and the use of kaikaku is, is a uh, much more effective approach. And that's what most of these 
uh, events that we're going to show you by way of case study uh, are all about. They're their Kaikaku events. So I think I've shown you this slide every time uh, we've had a webinar. I just want to reinforce the fact that just like barnacles grow on the side of a ship and slow it down, we want to scrape those things off and we want to make sure that we're using a systematic approach, which is the definition of lean, a systematic approach to identify and eliminate waste. I've also shown you last time, last month, we talked about 5S, and 5S has a, a lot to do with setup reduction. So the example I showed you last month about the machine shop in Astoria, Oregon, uh, where the before and after picture here are pretty telling, the before condition was they, they had nothing identified and things were stacked up like cordwood, and now it looks like a doctor's office in there and you can find anything you need within 30 seconds. That has significantly changed their setup times. So uh, 5S and uh, setup production go hand in glove. And we talked about this at uh, the manufacturer's conference uh, this week. Uh, poker and manufacturing is really something they call a zero-sum game. And you want, in poker, if you're playing for the chips on the table, if someone wins, that mathematically somebody else has to lose. And in business, if you win a contract, unfortunately it means uh, somebody else has lost that contract. So we want to be on the right side of the zero-sum equation. And setup reduction is one of those tools, one of the fundamentals that if you don't do this well, it's really actually – pretty tough to do the rest of the lean manufacturing tools uh, if you're not uh, managing the fundamentals well and setup reduction is really one of those fundamentals. So look at the the car sales in America as of January 2012 and we were still obviously in a recovery mode but some of the leaders in the car sales are the Hondas and the Toyotas and the Hyundais and, and the Nissans and the, and the reason for that is they're able to have price points that are based on the fact that they can change their stamping equipment out in a matter of minutes where it still takes us hours to change those over in, in the American uh, automobile manufacturers. Uh, they, they, they're catching them, but it's taking a while. We're, we're not as finely tuned in our setup uh, reduction efforts as they ha have been since they've been working at this for years and years. Uh, the Japanese have have so many more techniques in place that we need to adopt in our manufacturing environments. It's uh, tough to catch them when they're that far out in front. Einstein said to repeat a process and expect a different result is really the definition of insanity. We cannot continue to do what our dads and granddads did and, and, and set up machinery the way they did it uh, after World War II. Uh, th there was just a there was no competition in the world. All, all the manufacturing capability had been either destroyed or modified to support the war effort worldwide. And so in America, we had, we had a captive market. Now that's changed. And in order to compete, we're going to have to adopt some of the same techniques that our competition has uh, discovered, and that includes setup reduction. So obviously... What's what's the best setup? And I've been told it's it's no setup, and that that would be ideal. But in most job shops, particularly, it's probably unrealistic to think that you're going to have no setup. Uh, there's always a changeover from from part type to part type when it's not hard tooled and dedicated equipment. So if if the best setup is no setup, and, and that's not realistic for us, then what's the next best thing? And that's what we're going to show you now. So we really focus on the difference between the value added and the non-value added and if you look at if you look at and break down the components in a, in a normal setup what you find is only about 5% of only about 5% of the time in a setup mode is actually spent doing setup the majority of it is finding tooling and getting rid of the other material that you just finished and uh, looking for blueprints and looking for pallets and all the activities that surround the setup, but it has nothing to do with putting new tools in the machine, which is really, on average, is about 5% of the setup or the machine downtime. So that's what we want to focus in on, is getting and extracting all the non-value added activities that consume resources but pay no dividends. I used to uh, shop at Costco. Our family had a deli, and uh, we would go to Costco, but 
uh, and I appreciate their business model. They're very successful. But one of the things that I came to appreciate as we after we did not have the deli any any longer was that when I go to shop at Costco, they have a an eight pound brick of cheese or a twenty five pound bag of oatmeal, and it and it makes it makes it seem like that's the best buying solution for me and my family, but trouble is I can't eat eight pounds of cheese, and so it sits in the refrigerator and, and turns green with mold, and, and the 25-pound bag of oatmeal ends up degrading, and i got to store it, and it takes up too much room in the, in the pantry. And so we got to ask our question, ourselves the question, has Costco convinced us that buying a big batch is better because it takes them and their vendors more time than it should to set up to change to a five pound bag of oatmeal or a two pound block of cheese. Why is it that they why is it that we try to convince our customers to buy a big batch? Well it's because we have to amateurize the cost of the setup or the machine downtime across a larger set of components and that way it doesn't cost us so much to set up our machine. But the Japanese has have taught us a new way and that is we can always cut the setup time in half. And as you'll see in these case studies, uh, we've we've seen it cut as much as 92%, uh, saving hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So it it permits you to retrain your customers and and yourself to not have to make a big batch size and then try to convince your customer that it's cheaper to buy it in a big batch. You can actually give them what they need when they need it. So it, again, examining what normally takes place in a setup. Only 5% of the time are we
So here's another uh, a machine shop, and you can see that this is a Haas machining center. Uh, and it was taking the operator about three hours and 16 minutes to do his setup. And if you'll notice, there was these little yellow bins here that were just full of nuts and bolts and spacers and washers, and, and, and it was never the right one. So he was always running to the tool room to get what he needed. Um, and so we did a little bit of setup production slash 5S and reorganized his work area so that now his setups only take 27 minutes instead of over three hours. And everything's brought to him, uh, including paperwork, uh, all of his tools, all of his holders, all of his measuring devices he might need, all of his paperwork. And again, my goal would have been to get this down to less than 10 minutes, uh, and, and they may continue to work on this and get it down to there, but it's certainly an improvement over three hours and 16 minutes. He also saved uh, from uh, 3,800 feet of walking, if I remember right, down to just, just a few hundred feet. Now here's a company that, that uh, wraps veneer around molded substrate that might be finger jointed together and you might not want this finger jointed material uh, hanging around a window in your home. So they wrap it with beautiful, beautiful red oak, but it takes, it takes hundreds of these little wheels uh, to press that veneer onto this molded substrate. And it, it again was taking over three hours of setup to set this machine up. So the company came up with, and you can see a wheeled cart here, hopefully, uh, where they pulled a cartridge out and put another cart, just like you might a tape deck out of your car, just pull it out of the machine and shove this next uh, cartridge in already set up. And it took the setup from three hours, more than three hours, I should say, down to 17 minutes. Now, somebody still has to set this cartridge up offline. And that still takes hours. I, I'm not going to kid you. And, and they did buy a couple of these that were dedicated for their most popular profiles. But they are such a custom shop that these hundreds of wheels have to be set almost every single time. And that still takes hours. But at least now it's done offline and, and the machine is not down with the six people who run the machine normally uh, sweeping while a couple of setup people uh, adjust all these wheels. So when we did that particular project, we had to cost justify those cartridges, and they were very expensive. So I know this is, again, a lot of mathematics to have to look at. I just want to have you focus on a couple of numbers. Uh, they sold these pieces for about $10 a piece, and they sold 10,000 of them a year. So their average lot size was 1250 and they would get eight orders a year. And so they would be carrying some inventory, $625 of inventory every year for each of these 100 part numbers that they carried. Uh, so that added up to a significant amount of cost and just carrying cost if you figure 10% interest. Um, when the machine was down for 40 minutes and an operator uh, was paid $10 uh, because for, uh, 40 minutes is two-thirds of uh, $17, I believe it was, that he was making an hour. Anyway, it cost $10 of wages to set the machine up, and he threw five pieces away, which were each worth $10, so they threw $50 worth of stuff away during the setup, and then there was a planning cost. The total annual setup cost for these eight setups and the $50 worth of waste every time and the 100 part numbers that he that he actually – uh, had to run through that machine, added up to all.
So here's another company that does aerospace work. They make, uh, if you've been on an airplane and you, uh, the overhead compartments and so forth, they, these guys make a lot of that uh, material. Uh, and this was their prototype shop. And we were doing uh, some mill and lathe uh, vertical machine center work and setup reductions, uh, including the prototypes or the first runs. So here was their current condition. Uh, it was taking from 2 to 16 hours. 70% uh, of the processing time was setup time because they'd never ran it before. So you might say, well, I can see how setup reduction applies to things we've done over and over and over again, but what about prototypes? That You're not going to change that setup, right? Because you got all this inspecting to do. And so this, the setup sheets weren't always clear. Uh, there was a lack of uh, uh, identification of what you're going to be measuring and how you're going to be setting it up. So this, this particular pro process, uh, we wanted to go in and have a 50% reduction, uh, not only in the setup time, but also in the run time. Because when you first run something, there's a lot of stopping and starting and trying to figure out, are my tool offsets correct, and, and so forth. So we wanted this to be something that was uh, generic, and the solutions would be applied to any machine on any process, whether it was prototype or not. So again, as you see in a pattern here, I'm sure, uh, this is the initial setup. And again, I've hidden some rows so you can see it. This goes from step 8 to step 108, but there was a 111 steps in this process that was an hour and three minutes long for this one, which was a pretty short uh, setup for them. The operator traveled 1,738 feet. There was 20 setups a month, uh, so therefore 240 setups a year. The miles walked and so forth. We externalized as much as we possibly could, and theoretically, we said we cut this in half, 33 minutes. Here was his spaghetti diagram. He used to walk 1,768 feet. He now walks 30 feet. You could have tied a five-foot rope to his belt buckle. He was never more than 30 feet away from his machine. Now, what would that mean over the course of a year if you're doing multiple setups every day or every week? You're going to be paying somebody a lot less time for walking and a lot more time for that machine or that race car to be out on the track. So the downtime used to be 63 minutes, an hour and three minutes, now it's less than 20 minutes. So we had a 60% improvement overall. They said that even though this was a small little department, they were really just trying to teach the set of production techniques, they said they had picked this prototype department. They said even in this little department, it's worth $70,000. So pretty huge potential. The benefits are they have 36% more machine capacity. And they said that's the same as going out and buying a, another third of a machine. So, you know, it's uh, it lowers their lead times. It, it improves their ability to deal with the uh, the constant surges of work that come in kind of uh, and ebb and flow through their shop. One of the things that we had to do there was a little brainstorming, and I'm sure you're familiar with uh, this uh, old TQM tool called the uh, Ishikawa diagram or the cause and effect diagram. And they said their, their process was uh, challenging because of long setups. And that was the effect. And the input or the, or the, uh, uh, the cause was either mother nature, they had bad lighting or uh, stress, which could have been caused by time constraints, or it could have been manpower, the method they used, the machine itself, the materials and, and management. So, uh, we couldn't fix everything in, in one motion, but what they did during this Kaizen event was get rid of all of these things. So, again, I'll back up and show you. These are the things that were getting in their way and causing long setups, and they were able to remove those things, and it made it very visual for them to be able to, to identify what's left on the target, and it might be absenteeism or lack of confidence, uh, in a comp uh, vendor or, or or to a customer, an in-house customer. So that's one of the tools that we applied there as well as uh, just setup reduction. They had lots of ideas for improvement. It's not uncommon to see 100 or 200 ideas for improvement come out of one of these setup reduction projects. Here's, here's some more of their ideas, and it continues on. Here's some more ideas. And I won't read these all to you, but just you can see just lots of ideas for improvement. 
And, of course, they couldn't get it all done. I think this was like a three-day Kaizen event, if I remember right. Uh, couldn't get it all done in that three days, so there was a, a 30-day list of things to follow up on. The important part here is that we had a responsible party identified and, and a date by which that was going to be completed. all the setup production techniques uh, that everybody else has already proven. You don't have to rediscover this. This is a uh, almost old hat. But again, change is tough. When you introduce change, people go into the shock, and we know this change curve. Uh, people then go into denial. You know, this will go away. You'll hear things like, oh, they tried this at the last company. Uh, don't worry, this will this will go away. They'll get tired of this. And when it doesn't go away, they get angry. And they have to point fingers of blame. But finally, finally, people start to accept change, problem solve, take action, and make decisions, and finally the change is implemented. But it's almost impossible to avoid this uh, emotional trough if you don't get them involved. So the message that we try to uh, send to our clients is be ready for the change curve, and that's where we can add and contribute uh, is helping people make it through this change curve without, without losing good people. Uh, and we got to get people involved. That, that's the secret. And we got to mobilize their intellectual resources. Uh, you can't do this by yourself, no matter how good you are. And, and I've been doing this uh, 600 Kaizen events. I'd say half of them uh, have either been 5S or setup reduction. So I, I know how to use these tools. But uh, I can tell you, I can't do it without the people who actually do the work. So you've got to get them involved. And so for the last two 
uh, webinars we've had, we've talked about 5S, and we've talked about changeover, uh, fast changeover. And so next, next uh, webinar, I want to talk about value stream mapping, and we have really uh, invented, had to, out of necessity, invented a new kind of a value stream mapping process uh, that permits you to value stream map high mix and low volume environments. So I've talked about it a few times, but this time we're really going to do it. Uh, we're going to we're going to teach you uh, an entirely Excel format for value stream mapping that's easy to maintain. Anybody can do it. And the next uh, uh, webinar that we have, which is going to be scheduled for November 8th, which is a Friday at 1230, we are going to do value stream map training, and we hope you sign up for that. Uh, we also hope that if you're interested in a copy of a free lean assessment, you'll uh, email Lorraine, who is kind of in charge of all these webinars, and we'll get you a copy of not only the setup reduction spreadsheet, but also a free lean assessment where you can ask uh, 71 questions of you and your, and your team uh, to find out just exactly where you are in terms of a benchmark uh, against what I would consider industry standards for those companies that are fairly mature in, in their lean transformation. And also, if you, if you feel like you need help with this lean assessment, uh, we're, we're available and, and more than willing to come uh, either by way of a, a little mini webinar just between you and us, uh, like we're doing here, but just one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. We can do these free lean assessments o over the phone or via the web, or, or we can do it in person. And we got lots of folks on our team, uh, myself, uh, along with Ray and Stacy and Marty and Kathy here in the north, and we also got Angela, Jeff, Mary, and Ed down in the south, and Terry's always there to help too. So please visit our website, watch for upcoming events, uh, mark your calendars for uh, November 8th, uh, which is a Friday. Uh, we're going to do the, the value stream mapping webinar.